Well, like I said, it's good to be back with the Dozer of Grace family this morning. This is the first Sunday I've been back to preach since the news two weeks ago that uh, I will officially be joining the staff here. Um, and I know I said a few words the other week, but I just want to spend just a second again to, to thank everyone. To I want to make sure I, I, I thank all of you for the warm welcome that uh, my family and I had received from the, from the family here since the very beginning of our involvement here. It didn't just start after the announcement two weeks ago. We really felt a warm welcome from the very beginning. And I want to also thank Pastor Jeff and the, and the elder team for being willing to bring me on staff here. I don't take it lightly. I certainly don't. I want to make sure that I thank everyone involved. And as my family and I started looking forward to the start of my position in January, I just want to pray that or ask that all of you be praying. I want to ask that all of you be praying for my family and I as the Lord prepares us, uh, prepares our hearts, and prepares our abilities to minister here well. And I'd also ask that you would all be praying that Devil Word Grace Church would continue to be a place committed to the name of Jesus, committed to the proclamation of his name, both inside and outside the doors. And, and, and I'd ask you to pray for this new chapter in the life of the church. Pray that he would invigorate those already existing efforts for Jesus. I ask that we would, as a church family, never tire to be praying about those things. And like I said, I said this already two weeks ago, but again, my family and I are very excited. We're very excited to be here. We're very excited to, for January to come so we can jump in with both feet. But this morning, we will be in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Speaking of the Bible, the Bible is a book that I love to engage with for really the majority of my life. I came to Christ very early on in my years. And so ever since middle school, the Bible truly has fascinated me. The idea that I could know about God and know about God's world through the pages of this book in front of us, it's just always fascinated me. And, 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 and the fact that we can also learn theology from this book, we can learn about God and about his world, it's not only driven my personal faith, but it's also driven much of my passion for ministry. I love the Bible, and I love the theology that we get from the Bible. And if you don't know that about me, I, I truly do love theology. Uh, my love for the theology, along with my desire to be well-prepared for ministry, is one of the reasons why I went to college for theology. And I've always felt like my brain, I always felt like God has wired my brain well for theology. I don't know, I just always felt that way. But as the Lord was forming me in my mother's womb, and as he was wiring my brain for theology, wiring my brain to love and to desire to know about him and theology, he must have missed a few wires we came to mass. I've always said that. Uh, I'm convinced that all the wires that were intended for the part of my brain that had to do with math, the Lord took those wires and he put them into the part of my brain that had to do with theology. I am not good at math. Now, I can do things like basic arithmetic. I can do things like super basic algebra. But as soon as any kind of complex equations come into the mix, I'm lost. Just count me out immediately. When I was in school, I, I, I was never good at figuring out which formula to use in which mathematical situation. I'm horrible at Couldn't do it to save my life. So, you know, was it y equals mx plus b? Was it c squared equals a squared plus b squared? I had no idea. And I hope that no one in school cheated off of my math tests because they would be hurting if they did. I could, I could plug numbers into formulas just as well as the next guy but I couldn't figure out which formula to plug the numbers into in the first place. That was my issue, which let's be honest, that's a pretty big issue 
when it comes to math. It never made sense to me. So even when I was told what formula to use in math class, I still didn't understand why. So, so I can just end up trusting that the formula would give me the right answer, even when I, I had no idea how or why that formula would give me the right answer. And so I really struggle in classes like Algebra 2 and classes like Pre-Calculus. But surprisingly enough, I didn't struggle as much in physics class. And, and physics is fundamentally mathematic, but there was something about math applied to real life situations of what physics is. Things like um, uh, the speed of a moving ball or the mass of a moving train, these kinds of things. There was something about applying those mathematical situations to real life that made more sense to me. But even in phys physics class, where I, I felt more capable, I still couldn't figure out why certain formulas work for certain situations. At the end of the day, I had to trust if the formulas would give me the right answers, even when I couldn't figure out models. A good mathematician knows what formula to use because he or she knows how the formulas work. And a good mathematician, at least he generally knows why those formulas pop out the right answer. But I am not a good mathematician. And in one sense, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 teaches us that none of us are good mathematicians, not when it comes to numbers, but when it comes to life. None of us know the perfect formulas for life. And all of us have serious limitations to understanding how and why life works in the first place. None of us can quite figure it out. And we're told as much in verse 17 of chapter 8. Man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. And being a book of the Bible, you might expect Ecclesiastes to spend more time giving us formulas for life rather than telling us that we can't figure it out. We would expect that from the Bible. We would expect the Bible to give us formulas for how to live life. But that is not what we find here in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Instead of giving us formulas for life, Ecclesiastes gives us faith for life. It teaches us to have faith in God, even when we can't figure out the work. Have faith in God, even when we can't figure out the world. With that main idea in mind, let's read the passage together. We're going to read the whole thing. So starting in verse 1, here's what Ecclesiastes 8 says. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oak feet. Be not hasty to go for his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and a just way. For there is a time and a way for everything. Although a man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man hath power over man to his hurt. Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised to the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days of a shadow, because he does not fear God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth 
that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity, and I commend joy for man. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I apply my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, how neither day nor night do one's eyes sleep. Then I saw all the works of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man they toiled in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Have faith in God, even when we can't figure out the work. And there are two worldly situations that the preacher addresses in these 17 verses. There are two worldly situations that we find the preacher looking at and saying, I just can't quite figure that out. But he determines to have faith through those things anyways. And those two worldly situations are situations that we experience every day, just like the preacher day. And those two situations are imperfect political leadership and wickedness. In verses 1 to 9, the preacher turns to ten, to the first of these two situations imperfect political leadership. And he shows in these nine verses that faith in God teaches us wise submission to imperfect political leadership. The book of Ecclesiastes is rarely easy to grasp at first read. So let's break down this idea here for a moment and see how and where he talks about this in this first section. Starting from the top, we know that the preacher has wisdom in mind because of how he starts the chapter. He says, a man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. In one sense, we can kind of call that the topic sentence. And it tells us that he's about to talk through what it looks like to live wisely on here. And then, moving on to verse 2, based on verse 2, we know that it's not just wisdom in general that he's going to think and talk through, but specifically wise submission to political leadership. He makes this very plain in the second verse when he says, keep the king's commands. But why does he tell us to submit to political leaders? Why does he tell us to keep the king's commands is it because he's just assuming that political leaders are so good at leading that political leaders always lead with perfection and goodness. But we know that's not the reason, not just because of our own personal experience, but because of what he says in the next handful of verses. At the end of verse 9, the preacher tells us that he observed man having power over other men to their hurt. Right there, he's talking about political readership. In other words, the, the king that he mentions in verses 2 to 5 is the very man that he is observing in verse 9 to have power over other men to their hurt. So he's addressing imperfect political leadership, political leadership that hurts those under him. And so he doesn't tell us in verse 2 to submit to political leaders because of their ability to live or to lead with goodness or fairness. But instead, he says in verse 2 that it's because of God's oath to him. In other words, the preacher in verse 2 is saying the very same thing that Paul says in Romans 13.1, not read it for us. He says this, Let every person be subject to to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And so verse 2 is really, at its core, a confession of faith in God and His Son. 
taken with the rest of the section, taken with the rest of the nine verses, it's a confession that says, Lord, even though I see imperfect political leadership like before me, the kind of leadership that is oppressing people, I still have faith in you and your sovereign control over this world. And that faith teaches me not to rage against political leadership, but to live wisely in the face of it. And that's quite a confession. The confession that says to live wisely is not to rage against imperfect political leadership, but to truly figure out how to live wisely. That's quite the confession. And as we see him do this, we're seeing the preacher take for granted that even wicked political leadership falls squarely within the plans and the purview of our God. And this is such a corrective for us. Because how often do we convince ourselves that, yeah, 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 I think God, he can work with good political leadership, but there's no way he could work with, quote unquote, bad political leadership. How many times do we functionally operate in the way that we talk amongst each other or even in the way that we despair at the sight of our political leadership as if God's sop and plans are out the window as soon as we see someone come into office who we wouldn't quite define as a good political leader? We're reminded here that this is not the case. God's sovereignty stands regardless of who is in political office. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 21 to 22, stands true in good leadership and in bad leadership. And it says this, My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for a disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin come from both of them. So the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act in the midst of imperfect political leadership must always be controlled by our faith in God. And our faith in God tells us that He is sovereign, that He has control regardless of what it looks like and what we think. Control over everything. And so we can't confess that while God might be sovereign over our individual lives, He can't be sovereign over the throne because of what it looks like. Now inevitably there are many different political views in this room. But my plea for all of us is to not what, miss what the preacher is saying because all we can think about is what we wish he would say. And this text is surprisingly timely for us no matter who would have been voted into office two weeks ago. If Vice President Harris was voted into office, we would have imperfect political leadership. Now that Donald Trump is voted into office, we have imperfect political leadership. It doesn't matter who is in office, we have imperfect political leadership. And so the current, re I mean, this is, not, this is not theoretical for us. It's the current reality of imperfect political leadership that makes verses one to nine extremely applicable for us today. And as the preacher reflects on imperfect political leadership's relationship with God's sovereignty. We need to tune in close. We need to listen well. Because we just had an election to we've seen. The reality of imperfect political leadership, that yeah, we can be honest here, it, it, it's quite overwhelming for us. We often look at the world, look at politics, and we think to ourselves, how in the world can I fix all the political issues I'm seeing? How in the world can I fix the seemingly corrupt system 
that I'm part of. We see government legislation that devalues life. We see government legislation that ignores God's created design for men and women. And we see much more than that as well. And so it's easy for us to put our head in our hands in despair, wondering how to fix it all. The question, kind of fix it all, is quite a big question. But surprisingly enough, that is not the question that we find the preacher asking or answering in Ecclesiastes 8. He is not using wisdom to try and figure out how to fix the system, but how to fix himself as he lives within the system. He's contemplating how a wise person handles their personal feelings and their personal actions in the face of imperfect political leadership. I want to make sure I say, yes, we should work toward positive change in politics and government legislation. But working towards positive change is a far cry from convincing ourselves that we can fix it all. And so when he says things in verses 5 to 7 like, the wise heart will know the proper time and the wise way. When he says that there is a time for everything. And when he says that he does not know what is to be. In verses 5 and 7, these are all confessional statements that recognize God's ultimate control over everything, over all of time despite his own failure, despite the preacher's own failure to figure it all out. Although he can't figure out when or how imperfect political leadership will be fixed, he knows that God has faked it up. There's a commentator who conveys this thought so well, and he says it this way. The preacher reaffirms the lack of control that human beings have. But the wise heart knows about time and judgment. In other words, knows that God is, has it under control. And this influences both his thinking and his actions when confronted with imperfect political leadership. And so we can say all day long, and so we're blue in the face that God is sovereign even when there's bad political leadership. We can say it all they want. But how is it actually affecting the way that we think, the way that we feel, and the way that we act? The same commentator who gave that quote says something else that really cuts to the heart of this issue. He says this, we can always tell what our real devotion and trust are given over to by knowing when we feel most threatened, framed, and angry. We can always tell what our real devotion and trust are given over to by knowing when we feel most threatened, frightened, and angry. Is this how we feel now that we know who our next president is? Is this how we felt at the possibility that Vice President Harris would be our next president. There's nothing wrong with feeling a sense of longing for something better when it comes to political leadership, but never a sense of controlling despair or fear or, or anger. And honestly, we should always have a longing for something better. Because we're all eagerly anticipating the return of Christ. The question is, will we have faith in God now, even if we can't figure out how to fix the world around us, how to fix the politics around us? We have a tendency to want to fix things before committing to have faith through them. But the encouragement here is to have faith through things even when we can't fix it. On this side of heaven, we will not be able to completely fix or figure out the imperfect political leadership. And, according to the next handful of verses, not only will we be able to figure out how to completely 
fix wickedness. In verses 10 to 17, we find the preacher reflecting on the, the problem of wickedness prospering. And as he reflects, he shows that faith in God teaches us not to despair when wickedness prospers. Throughout this whole section, verses 10 to 17, the preacher is observing wicked people prosper, and he's admitting, he's throwing his hands up in the air, and he's saying, I, I can't figure this out. Why is this happening? He says in verse 14, he says this, there is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and that there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. In other words, the righteous seem to be treated wickedly, and the wicked seem to be treated righteously. And then his final statement on the problem is in verse 17. Man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. But even though that might be his final word on the problem, right, that he just can't seem to figure out why it is that the wicked prosper, it's not what he lets control his demeanor about the problem. As he wrestles with wickedness, he at the same time rests in God. We can and should honestly wrestle with the wickedness of the world. We can and should pray to God, Lord, why do I see the wicked prosper and why do I see the righteous fail? But even if everything around us seems to tell us that the world is in an uncontrolled chaos, we must break our faith in God's goodness and in God's sovereignty to bear on our reality. This is what the preacher does, especially in verses 12 to 13. He confesses that he knows God is still in control even when he sees the wickedness prosper. Verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. In other words, he has faith in God, we can't figure it out. When things around us tell us that there's no rhyme or reason to the madness, that everything around us just looks and feels like chaos, living wisely, living faithfully, doesn't mean figuring out how to fix it all. When there's war in the Middle East, when there's war in Ukraine, when there's yet another school shooting, when someone in your life prospers, even though you see them doing evil, we don't despair. We trust in God. We proclaim our trust in God that He is still in control and that in the end, He will make everything right. And then, based on that confession, we cultivate our feelings and our actions to be in accord with that confession. A wise life doesn't mean answering all questions of life. It means resting in God's control despite the questions. In other words, we don't define our God by the observations of the world. We define our observations of the world by our God. We don't look in the state of the world and say, hey, this is just proof that God doesn't have it under control. This is just proof that God doesn't care and isn't good. Instead, we look at the state of our world and say, this is just proof that the only way I can function well within a wicked and fallen world is because I know that God has it under control. This is just proof that when the end of things comes, God will show himself to be good in how he renews and perfects everything around us. It's easy for opponents of Christianity to, to wag their finger at us 
and say, how could you believe in God, even with all the wickedness in our world? But our response can be, how could you live in a world where you don't know whether or not all this wickedness will be made right in the end? Because we know that it will be. And the gospel of Jesus Christ helps us here. When we look at the gospel, when we look at the power of God for salvation displayed in the horrible death of Jesus on a cross, we realize that the struggles and the evils and the wickedness of this world are not where our faith goes to die. They're where our faith goes to flourish. During World War I, a time of unmatched wickedness and horror, there was a theologian who conveyed this idea so well. He said this, Our faith did not arise from the order of the world. The world's evil and disorder, therefore, need not destroy. Rather, our faith rose from the sharpest crises, from the greatest war, from the deadliest death, and from the deepest grave the world ever knew in Christ's cross. In the midst of a wicked world that doesn't make sense to us, where else is it better to turn than to the redemption of the cross that proved that God works in the things that don't make very much sense to us? Because the fact that God could turn a victory from death doesn't really make perfect sense to us. But that is exactly what he did in Christ on the cross. And so as we honestly wrestle with the wicked state of the world, we can honestly declare our trust in the Lord. And, and we don't just declare it, we cultivate it. And so don't hear me say that, that we shouldn't be saddened or we shouldn't be heartbroken by the wicked things we see in this world. Don't hear me say that we shouldn't work against wickedness or do all that we can to produce good because all of that matters and we should do it. But we will not have the stamina and we will not have the heart to do it in the first place if we don't continually dwell on God's faithfulness, on God's faithful and good control of the entire universe on where we know he is taking this world. And we don't just know where he's taking this world out of blind faith. It's because we know what he's done in history. We know what he's accomplished in Christ of the cross. And so on the basis of what he has accomplished in Christ on the cross, we can say yes and amen to Revelation 21 verses 4 and 5. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. The gospel of Jesus, it doesn't just save us. It teaches us how to live. Live, by the way, in the midst of a messy world. And I've talked a lot this morning about how to think when it comes to faith in God, despite a messy world. But maybe we're still wondering, okay, but what do I do? I've talked about cultivating feelings, actions, and demeanors. But I haven't quite gotten to what feelings, actions, and demeanors to cultivate. So let's close by answering that question. What do I do? What feelings and actions do I cultivate in light of my faith in God in a messy world? First, we should tame our expectations. That seems a lot at first. We should tame our expectations, especially when it comes to interaction with imperfect political leadership. I'll explain when I be near. In verses 1 to 9, the preacher tells us that the fact of the matter it is, we will not ultimately be able to fix things. Verses 3 and 4 specifically, when he teaches not to go hastily from the king's presence or to say to him, what are you doing? 
He's telling us that we shouldn't be too hasty or too brazen when it comes to our speech and our action when it comes to bad political leadership. We shouldn't be too quick to publicly and defiantly show our disapproval. Now, this needs some nuance. I want to be clear. This does not mean that we t- can't talk appropriately critical about politics. It doesn't mean that we can't work towards something better, especially since we are in the context of a democracy, because we should. In Jeremiah chapter 29, God tells his people to work for the good of the city where they live. And for us, part of working for the good of the city where we are is being involved in politics, appropriately involved in politics, doing things like voting. But even though we are engaged, even though we, we, we work toward a better politic, we must see reality for what it is. We must know that our engagement won't fix everything, and we shouldn't expect it to anyways. Because when we expect it to fix everything, we have somewhat of a savior complex. We think politics will take us where we need to go. And that is not the case. Now, this is not a defeatist attitude. It's simply part of the process of recognizing that that we are not going to be able to create a perfect world or a perfect government. Yes, we are intended to work toward that then. But we know that we are not the ones that would bring it to fruition. It's Christ, when he returns, who will bring a perfect world and a perfect politic. And so we keep that in mind as we gain dwifik. We don't let it defeat our attitudes, but we do let it tame our expectations, knowing he truly is in control and who truly will bring everything to its right end. Second, we should be patient. Part of taming our expectations is being patient because of what we know will happen at the end of time. We know that Revelation 21, which I read just a moment ago, will come true. And so we are patient as we wait for it. What we see right in front of us is not the full picture. We trust that God is sovereignly working out his control behind the scenes. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that the Lord is not slow to keeping his promises as some count slowness. And so we need to be patient in God's promises. And our patience, it affects the way we talk and the way we act and the way we feel around others. When we talk about the wicked state of our world and we talk about imperfect politics, we say in the same breath, but we know where the Lord is taking us. And that's not a platitude. That is a true confession in the Lord's sovereignty. Number three, you should live with integrity, not falling prey to wickedness around us, but living in light with God's control. We don't live in light of wickedness, and we don't live in light of imperfect political leadership. We live in light of God's sovereignty. How are the creature encouraged us to live in the state of the imperfect world that he describes? In verse 15, he tells us to live joyfully as before the Lord. What an odd encouragement after saying, all I see is wickedness, all I see is imperfect political leadership. Yet he says, I commend joy. And so integrity, it doesn't just teach us how not to live, it teaches us how to live. Because we know that God has things under control, because we know that he is good, even though we see evil in the world, we can live with joy. We don't mope through life. We delight in God's goodness and in the goodness of God's creation, even though we see wickedness all around us. And so wickedness doesn't stop our faith. This is integrity. This is living with integrity in light of God's sovereignty, not in light of the wickedness we see. And finally, we should live the faith. So I've been saying this whole time. 
even though the preacher sees nothing but the wicked cross. What does he confess in verses 12 and 13? He says that he knows wickedness will not prosper in the end. He says that it will be well, hence the title of my sermon, it will be well with the righteous in the end. These are confessions of faith. These are confessions that help us keep God in the center of our view as we look out at life. Helps us keep God's sovereign control of the world in view as we see wickedness and a mess all around us. And so faith, it's not, it's not pie in the sky naivety. Faith really affects our knowing and it really affects our living based on the work that not just God has promised to accomplish in the future, but the work that God has already accomplished in Jesus Christ and cross. We can trust that God will restore all things because it's all he's done to work for that restoration in Christ's cross. Christ's sacrifice for us presents an opportunity for us to be reconciled with the Lord, to be restored into a right relationship with the Lord. And so on this basis, we can have faith and live like we have faith that God will restore all things. Let's pray. Father, help us have faith. We're just so often wired to want to fix and figure things out. And Lord, there's a place for that. We know there is. But never at the expense of our faith in you. And so Lord, I pray that we take a cue from Ecclesiastes chapter 8. That when we can't figure things out, we would have faith in you. And that we would live with patience, tamed expectations, integrity, and faith. And by of knowing, not just guessing, knowing that you are in sovereign control over this universe. It's not easy. Thank you for Jesus of the cross who has guaranteed what you promised to do in the future.